Hey friends, welcome back to the Happy Homestead. I'm Amanda. We're in the kitchen today and we are going to make an artisan sourdough boule for our Make Bread 365 challenge for the month of May. So I am participating in this challenge for all of 2023. And the premise is that you really learn how to make a lot of your own bread products. And every month we hone in on something new. I will put the playlist above so that you can save that playlist, go through it. For the month of January, it was sandwich bread. February was focaccia. March was tortillas. April was bagels and May is an artisan loaf. Now they're not all have to be sourdough, right? You can choose if you wanna use just an active dry yeast, or if you wanna do a sourdough, a more fermented loaf, and that's what we're doing today. So I already have my ingredients weighed out. We're gonna get this going and we're gonna make the most beautiful boule. I have 600 grams of flour. I did 450 grams of hard white wheat and 150 grams of all purpose. Normally I do just a whole wheat flour, but this time I added in a little all purpose because it just makes the the dough or the, the bread rather a little bit more airy a little bit lighter right whole wheat flour is pretty dense so i just cut it with 150 grams of the all-purpose you can choose to do all all-purpose all whole wheat or any combination in between um, you are going to be looking for a bread flour and usually on the back of the package in the ingredients it's going to say either hard red or hard white I have 420 grams of filtered water. I have my Redmond Real Salt here. We're gonna add about a pinch of that. And then I also have my sourdough starter. I fed this about 24 hours ago. It is active, ready to go. I'm gonna turn my scale on. I measure everything in grams. And I'll write the recipe down below for you as well. All right, so to my 420 grams water, I'm gonna add 100 grams of starter. And you'll know that your starter is ready. There's two ways, right? You can see that it's risen, almost doubled is really what you're looking for. And you can also just take a little bit and put it in some water and it should float. If it floats, your starter is ready to use. And that's what you would call active starter, right? Sometimes you see recipes for sourdough discard, and that's basically sourdough that is not active. It's been discarded away. But this recipe you need active. So we're looking for 100 grams. And if sourdough is totally new to you and uh, you're interested in learning more, I will put the playlist above where you can learn how to make your own sourdough starter and then how to use it and make some delicious breads. We use sourdough starter for, I would say 90% of our bread products. Every now and then I will use an active dry yeast, uh, but I prefer to use the fermented sourdough. All right, just about 100 grams. I'm just gonna mix it in with the water. And I'm gonna add about a teaspoon and a half of Redmond Real Salt to my flour. And we're gonna add our starter water in. And again, when you're making any kind of sourdough bread, it takes time. It is probably one of the most hands-off processes for you, but it does take time to make. And so, like I said, I fed my starter yesterday morning about 24 hours ago. I am now mixing up my dough and we're gonna do a series of stretches and folds over the next hour or two. I'd say about hour and a half to two hours. And then we're just gonna let it bulk ferment and rise here on the counter. Um, tonight, we will put it in our banneton 
and then put it in the fridge to bulk ferment overnight and we will cook it and score it and make it so beautiful tomorrow. So sourdough bread is not an instant, let's make bread and have it for dinner tonight. It's more like let's make bread so we can have it uh, when we need it in a day or two. But once you get into the rhythm of doing that, it's so simple and it's not a big deal. It's just a framing, you know, change the way you're thinking about it, framing your mind differently. Okay, this is all mixed together. Sometimes you just have to like stop yourself because <laughs> you just want to keep doing that. Um, I'm going to put just some beeswax on top and we're going to let it sit for about 30 to 40 minutes. It's been 35 minutes. We're going to do our first set of pulls and we're basically going to do about three sets of what we're calling pulls or stretches and folds. We're gonna be like stretching the dough and folding it. You'll see that in a second here. We're gonna do three sets and they're gonna be anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes apart. And what that does is it allows the gluten to really start to kind of coming together, but also relaxing and allows us to have a much more pliable dough. You'll see when I do this now, it's still gonna be a little bit stiff. And by the time we get to the third series, it's gonna be a lot looser. And if I were to like really pull right now, it would break. It would just start breaking right here. So, you know, you want to be careful because you don't want it to break. But as we continue in this stretch and fold series, it will become, like I said, more pliable where it comes up more. You just want to go all the way around one time. And that's it. I'm going to put the cover back on. All right, we're on our second set of pulls. I want you to see if there's any difference in the dough. I can tell it's already extending a little bit easier without risk of breaking off. Second set is done. We'll come back in another 30 to 45 minutes. This is our third and final pull. And you're gonna see a difference from the first pull to this one where it's gonna stretch really nicely. gluten proteins have relaxed a bit helps them the relaxing process really helps get that lofty sourdough that lofty bread okay so now I'm gonna let this sit on the counter just like this I'm actually going to just put it in a little bit of a ball here. I'm just going to leave this in the bowl here. It is currently 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm going to leave this here until early evening, and then we'll put it in our banneton. On the counter, room temperature, covered. So it's been about four, maybe a little over four hours since we did our last set of stretches, pulls, and folds. And uh, the dough doesn't look too much different, maybe a little bit bigger. It may have uh, risen a little bit. We are going to take it out very carefully and we're going to um, use the counter to kind of like form it into a really tight, tension topped ball and then we're going to flip that ball upside down carefully into our banneton now a banneton is kind of like this reed bowl and i spray it with water and fill it with uh, rice flour 
and then let it dry. So it's very crusty and dry for many uses, which is what you want because um, the gluten does not adhere to the rice flour. So it easily comes out of the banneton. Um, do not use regular flour, any type of wheat flour, right? It has to be something that the gluten is not going to adhere to. Rice flour is just an easy go-to. If you don't have a banneton, that is okay. You can actually use any other type of bowl, line it with fabric, but with the fabric, do the same thing. Dampen it with maybe a spray bottle and uh, kind of really douse it in rice flour let it dry, let it get crusty, and then use that. So here's our dough. I'm just going to very carefully bring it out of the bowl because you don't want to damage any of the beautiful sourdough bubbles that would have formed during our time on the counter. So when you're working with sourdough, you're never actually kneading the dough, right? Like you would a yeast bread. You're never actually kneading it. You're just very carefully moving it along. I want you to see what I'm doing here. I'm just kind of dragging it, but what that's doing is it's creating this tension top. I'm kind of like scooping my fingers a little bit under it. So here's the bottom of it so you can kind of see but I'm not crushing it and I'm not damaging any of the gas bubbles that have formed inside. So you just do this for a little bit till you're satisfied with the top and you'll feel it. You'll start feeling it, you know, have that tension up top. All right, one more. Carefully taut tension side down on the bottom of your banneton or bowl. And I'm just kind of like keeping that tension in place a little bit by scrunching this up. This is going to be the bottom of your loaf anyway, so this isn't going to really show. Okay, now we're going to cover this again. And this is now going to go in the refrigerator. So it's basically like another bulk ferment, people call it. What that means is you're really just letting your sourdough ferment the, the wheat grains, the, the flour bulk a lot, a long time. <laughs> That's really what that means. So it's going to go in the refrigerator overnight. And I do it in the refrigerator because I can much easier, my grammar feels out of whack tonight. I'm tired. <laughs> much easier. It's just easier to control um, rather than on the counter, right? Ambient room temperature, you could overproof your sourdough bread and you don't want to do that because then you're not going to get that beautiful loft uh, when you bake it. So I always proof it, overnight bulk it in the refrigerator. It takes a lot longer and that way I'm not stressed about being home at a certain time to get my bread and bake it. This way, it's everything slows down the fridge. Think of any other type of ferment that you do, whether it be kombucha or sauerkraut, right? You, you do it out here in the room temp, and then you put it in the fridge. And it doesn't ever stop fermenting, but it slows down drastically because of that lower temperature change. So we're gonna put it in the fridge. We'll come back tomorrow when I have time and when I'm ready, and then we will bake. Now, you can leave it in the refrigerator up to 36 hours, really, you just wanna check it, but that's the beauty of keeping it in the refrigerator and you make it work on your own time. Sourdough is not a quick fix, like I had mentioned earlier. You're not gonna start your dough and cook it for dinner that night. It's, it's the long game with sourdough, but work it into your routine, just get used to it. I find it, so much more freeing with my time to do sourdough than I do with any other type of yeast bread. Because a yeast bread, I feel like I've got to kind of stay on top of it to make sure it's not, you know, yeast bread's double, triple, quadruple in room temp pretty fast. And so if you're not on top of it, you could have a big mess on your hands. Whereas with sourdough, it really works for me rather than me working for it. So we'll come back tomorrow. I'll let you know how long I've kept it in the refrigerator. It's about 6.30 at night. 
So it's gonna be in there for probably close to 18 hours before we bake. And uh, tomorrow's the fun part because we get to do a really awesome design. All right, I'll see you then. Okay, it is time to bake the bread. It's seven in the morning, not the next day, but the following day. <laughs> I never got to it yesterday. Again, beauty of sourdough being in the refrigerator because life happens and you don't want these things that you're doing in your home to enhance your life to actually unenhance and, and make your life more difficult or more stressful. So my dough has been in the refrigerator for about 36 hours and it's hopefully going to be delicious. I say hopefully in a jokingly way, it's gonna be delicious. I need to turn my oven on to 500 degrees. Make sure there's no sheet pans in there. I have a large cast iron round Dutch oven here. Whenever you're doing a sourdough free form loaf, it doesn't matter if it's oval or round, I recommend cooking them in some sort of Dutch oven, a cast iron Dutch oven. It's going to, with, with the lid on, it's going to trap the heat um, trap the moisture so your loaf doesn't dry out too much and it's going to allow the loaf to just kind of explode up right as it comes out along the expansion line that you cut in and it just makes it that much more beautiful so I'm going to turn my oven to 500 and I'm going to put my Dutch oven in the oven to preheat with it So this is going to preheat for about 20 to 30 minutes. Your oven may do its little beep and tell you that it's preheated sooner than that. But trust me, go 20 to 30 minutes because it just allows it to get that really good high heat to get that expansion loaf. I'm going to take the banneton out of the refrigerator and I'm going to put it in the freezer. This is a little tip. Just trust me here. There we go. It's grown maybe a little bit, hasn't changed too much, but it looks great. Now you always wanna just kinda of touch your dough and see if it's overproofed. And this is what you were looking for. When you put your finger in it, it should bounce back and it should do it very slowly, which it is. You wanna make sure that as you put your finger in, your finger's just not going all the way through like it's just an un unleavened dough but you also wanna make sure it's not bouncing back really fast, right? It's gonna bounce back very slow, and that means it's proofed and it's not overproofed. All that means is that it's the, the yeast, the sourdough yeast, haven't spent themselves, right, through the fermenting process. That's what overproofed means. If you think about any other type of ferment or even just with your starter, your sourdough starter, eventually the yeast eat through all of the the sugars and everything in the jar, right? And that's when you have to like discard some and feed again. Well, it's the same principle here. Overproofed just means they've eaten through everything, they are done, <laughs> now they're gonna start kind of going back down and you don't want that to happen. That's why we keep it in the refrigerator to prevent that from happening too soon. All right, I'm gonna keep the cover on and I am just gonna put this in the freezer while we're preheating the oven for about 20 to 30 minutes. It's time to take the banneton out of the freezer and we're gonna score it. Okay, so I just took it out. It was only in for about 20 minutes. I have a cutting board here with a piece of clean parchment paper. What we're gonna do is put this on top and then flip. And because we froze it, this is going to hold its shape for a little while, I say a little while, a couple of minutes, while we go ahead and decorate and score. This is a new hack that I saw someone else um, over in the UK or in Europe do with their sourdough, and it turned out beautiful. So I'm excited to try this again. I've already done it once. Um, I got this doily at a, like a vintage antique market for $2. And I was just looking for something that was certainly round 
and had a really good design on the front or on the top that I could make into a pretty pattern on our dough. So what I'm gonna do is take some rice flour. Remember we talked about rice flour a little bit yesterday with the banneton. You don't wanna put regular flour on top. And I'm not covering the whole thing. I'm just doing this part of the design. And we're gonna slowly lift it off. And it's enough to see what I need to cut. So then I've got a clean razor blade and I'm just gonna make maybe about quarter inch deep cuts. I'm connecting my lines. I'm basically making like a star. Be very careful with your razor because it's sharp on both sides and you want to make sure you are not cutting yourself on the other side. I have done that plenty of times. Okay. And so it's not a perfect star, but it's going to come out gorgeous. And all I ever do then is just kind of accent underneath each of the points with another V. And by freezing the dough, it just helps the dough keep its shape a little bit better while you're doing this. Whereas otherwise, it could start really falling apart. So our oven's preheated, our Dutch oven's preheated. We're gonna put this back in a 500 degree oven for 20 minutes and then we will uncover and cook for a little longer. Okay, the timer is about ready to go off any minute now. Literally, there's one minute left. We are going to reset the timer for 20 minutes, but we're going to, there it is. We're gonna lower the temperature to 450 degrees and take the lid off. So 20 more minutes. Lower the temperature and let's take the lid off. It looks beautiful. I don't know if you were able to see the design at all. It looks beautiful. By taking the lid off now, the top can get more browned. It's still pretty pale at the moment, but it'll get browned and even more beautiful. The moment is almost here. I've got one minute left on the timer. It's important to note that you do not open the oven door to take a peek at your loaf, especially after you've taken the lid off, right? Because again, still moisture is in the oven and you don't want that to release along with all of that heat. So just be patient. I promise it is worth the wait. We're gonna take this out. I already have a, a rack here. I'm gonna lift it up by the parchment paper, put it on the rack and I eventually I'll kind of pull that parchment paper out from under it so the bottom can get some airflow and cool as well. We're not gonna cut into it for a few hours, so I'll come back and cut into it and show you what it looks like.
it's delicious because it went the longer ferment, right? 36 hours. It does have that sour taste, which we enjoy. If you don't, let it ferment less. I'm happy with the crumb. When you're using a whole wheat flour, you can't expect it to have the huge open holes and the huge loft that you get when using a more refined flour. So be forgiving of yourself because I'll tell you, it took me many years to just come to that realization despite what people told me. This bread is not only delicious, but it's so much more nutritious using a whole grain flour. Thanks for joining me today on our artisan sourdough loaf journey for the Make Bread 365 challenge. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you can stay tuned to what we're doing next month for the month of June and all the other fun things we're doing here on the homestead. Stay healthy, stay well. Bye-bye.